Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. Hope you guys are all having a wonderful day. Happy Monday. I hope you had a great weekend. Who doesn't love Mondays? Best day of the week, am I right? Good mystery Monday. So today is what we're doing, doing a mystery Monday. We're going to be talking about the Discord killer and I'm just going to go ahead and jump straight into this one. Let me start by introducing you to Moni Roo Zaman, a Bangladeshi national who in the late 1980s decided he was going to migrate from Bangladesh to Canada. He was doing this in search of a better life for himself and for more opportunities for his family and his future children. He had been arranged to marry a woman named Mamataz Begum, so the both of them moved to Canada together with the hopes of starting a family. They eventually got married and in 1996 they gave birth to their son Menhaz and then two years later they had a daughter named Melissa. They had really high hopes for their children, they expected them to excel academically because in their minds a good education would result in a good job which would allow them to have a comfortable life, a financially stable life, which, you know, they didn't have the luxury of having that growing up. And, you know, this is the success formula that they knew and the life that they wanted for their children. They wanted them to have every opportunity that they didn't have. Mamataz is described as being a really caring woman. There's stories of her being really generous with her friends. She would offer to drive them to the doctor and pay for their meals. She spent a lot of time preparing curries for her neighbor and then would deliver them to his house. So you can kind of paint a picture of how nurturing she is, just a really kind, and gentle soul. Moni Roos was more of an introvert. He's described as a humble man with a deep devotion to the Muslim faith. He worked as a taxi driver and there were several times where he was actually awarded as one of the company's outstanding drivers of the month and he was just a really hard worker who wanted the best for his family. Everything he did was for his wife and his children. Once they moved to Canada, all of their hard work eventually paid off and they were able to save up enough money to purchase a modest home in Scarborough on McCallum Road. Eventually, they were actually able to save up for two more investment properties, so a condo in Scarborough and a house in Danforth. And so Mamataz kind of became the rental manager for these properties. She did all of that kind of behind the scenes stuff, taking care of these places, making sure everything was running smoothly while Moni Ruse was out working as a taxi driver. And it was actually like a lot for her to juggle managing these properties on top of having two young children. So eventually her mother, Faruza, emigrated from Bangladesh as well. And she came to live with the family and would help out with caring for the children while Moni Ruse and Mamataz were working. And then by 2006, the family was actually able to upgrade and move into a four bedroom home in the neighboring city of Markham on Castlemore Avenue. Like I mentioned earlier, Mamataz and Moni Roos had really high expectations for their children. And one of their close family friends recounts Mamataz saying, in our community, you have to either be an engineer or a doctor. And by their community, they mean the large Bangladeshi expat community that they had in Scarborough, who they really fit in with, especially because Mamataz was so outgoing and sociable. Moni Roos really wanted his son Menhaz to become an engineer, whilst Melissa had dreams of becoming a neurosurgeon, so they both had really ambitious goals. Menhaz was clearly like his parents' favorite child, and I'll explain why a little later on, but there was like a very clear display of favoritism. Mamataz was like really over the top in the way that she cared for Menhaz. Menhaz, she would pick him up from school every day just for lunch and would always make herself available to cook food for him. She would reportedly leave events or hanging out with her friends just so that she could go and cook with him. She just wanted Menhaz to be happy and would really go out of her way to make that happen. Menhaz was really shy. He had a soft voice and would keep to himself at school. Academically, he was a pretty good student, but from what I gathered, it seemed like he was just not all that interested in school for himself and was more so just trying to please his parents. He was a sort of kid who put his head down, got the work done, but when he came home, it was time to play video games. Outside of this and school, the only other place he spent any significant amount of time was at the mosque with his father. With his high school graduation approaching, Menhaz told his parents that he'd been accepted into York University's mechanical engineering program, something that they were so incredibly happy about. And this 
this news really solidified Menhas as like, you know, their golden boy, their golden child, their favorite child, unfortunately. And I say unfortunately because it just, it's, it kind of sucks for everyone when there's a favorite child because the favorite child, like there's a lot of pressure. He would feel like he basically has the whole world on his shoulders. And then his sister, I mean, it would suck to know that you're just like the second best, like your parents clearly favorite your sibling. It's just not a good feeling. And Melissa was like the complete opposite of her brother as well. She was described as being a rebellious teen. She would often find herself at the center of conflict, both at home and at school. Despite having a 92% average in high school, she was suspended at one point for giving the middle finger to one of her teachers. She reportedly smoked weed and drank alcohol whilst living with her parents and would secretly date guys because I guess, you know, her parents were pretty strict about that and they weren't allowed to date. And like all of this is pretty normal stuff. Like to get into fights with your parents, to get in trouble at school, to drink, like it, date guys, it's pretty normal teenage stuff, but it caused a lot of conflict at home because her parents expected better of their children. And I guess as well, because they would compare her behavior to her brother and he was like the opposite, like good kid, good grades, didn't really step out of line. Despite all of the fighting between Melissa and her parents, she was still a devout Muslim and she had a great deal of love and respect for her parents, but they fought, you know? And like sometimes the fights would get so bad that the neighbors would call the police. And sometimes if Melissa like broke curfew, her parents, like her dad would just lock her out of the house. I mean, she never had to sleep outside because Mama Taz would go and like secretly unlock the door so that her daughter didn't have to sleep outside. But she's still a teenager, but it was just creating like a bit of a hostile environment at home at times. Menhaz actually tried to be the voice of reason. So when Melissa and Mama Taz would get into a fight, he would come and he would try to break it up and kind of diffuse the situation. But when his father was home, like when Mona Ruse was home and he was the one kind of getting into the arguments, Menhaz wouldn't get involved. So I guess that kind of speaks to his relationship with his father. Menhaz would just kind of go up, retreat to his room and play video games and hide out in there. His video game of choice was a game called Perfect World, which is a multiplayer role-playing game. And I'm not gonna get into like specifics of the game, but it was like a private server he played on. So that's a modified version of the game that's usually run by a group of players. And the version of the game had its own rules, its own community. This was separate to like the main actual game, if that makes sense. And it was a real community vibe on this server. Like players would spend a lot of time together online. They would connect from all different parts of the world while communicating on voice chat. And a lot of them became close friends. And although some of them were on the other side of the world, this was something that Menhas had hadn't really experienced in, not, in in his life. And so he was quite happy to have found, I guess, his own little community. I feel like it probably helped him escape from the world a little bit and from the hostile environment that was happening at home a lot of the time. I mean, things in the Zaman home were really kind of not going well, I guess, to say the least. Moni Ruse actually got arrested for shoplifting from a Canadian tire, but the charges were later dropped in exchange for community service. Melissa moved out of home to go and live with her boyfriend and Menhaz became extremely obsessed with Perfect World, I guess because it kind of took him away from the real world a little bit. In the real world at home, he had so much riding on his shoulders. For Mama Taz and Menhaz, like everything was kind of going downhill hill, but their one saving grace was their son, which is a lot of pressure. Menhaz was on track to become an engineer still, and this was like everything to his parents. They would always go on about it and how, you know, Menhaz was still a devout Muslim, but Mama Taz and Meni Ruz really weren't aware of what their son was going through behind the scenes. Holes in his faith were starting to show, and he was starting to post online about how he was kind of turning towards atheism. He also started dating a girl and I honestly don't know if this was like an online girlfriend or something because he was very private about it. He only told his online friends about his relationship and he would also complain to his online friends about his lack of 
of independence and how he yearned for control in his life. And he was online a lot. Like he was playing Perfect World so much that some of his online friends said that he would be playing when they went to sleep and then he would still be playing when they woke up in the morning. Like he was just always on there. It seemed like he was addicted to this game, right? He used it as a form of escapism from his real world. And I honestly don't know how he got anything done because he just seemed to be on this game all the time. Like he was still on track to become an engineer and I have no idea how, like I really don't know how he was like doing things outside of this game because it seemed like he was on it all the time, but no one outside the game, like no one in his real life seemed to notice a problem because he was still doing the things that he needed to be doing. He was still obviously studying and working his way towards becoming an engineer. Nobody in his life really seemed to know the extent of like how much he was playing video games. I think maybe they just thought when he was up there playing video games that he was just studying or something. I don't really know. They probably just turned a blind eye because of his academic success. Now, what they didn't know is that he wasn't actually attending York University, like he told them, like he had never gotten accepted into York University. He was attending a place called Seneca College for an electronic engineering program. So he'd been lying this whole time about all of this. And at Seneca College, his grades had started slipping. He'd begun missing classes. And in turn, he had actually started failing subjects, which required him to retake those subjects the next semester. And it was to the point where he actually ended up having to drop out entirely, which his parents were none the wiser about any of this. Like they thought he was going to York University, engineering degree, getting top marks, and they just kind of believed his word on all of this. And once Menhaz, you know, ends up dropping out of Seneca College entirely, that is when he starts finding himself in a really dark place. And instead of coming clean to his parents about everything, he just continued to lie to them. And you know, it's hard, like from an outsider's perspective, somebody who has never experienced this sort of tiger parenting, to fully understand what their relationship was like because similar cases like this that I've looked into, it does seem like when your parents put this much pressure on you and you're not actually living up to their expectations, it results in the children just lying to their parents a lot about everything. They feel like they have to lie because their parents have such high expectations of them and they don't want to disappoint them, especially, you know, considering he was like the golden child because his sister was so different and she was like the rebellious one. So he kind of felt like, I guess he had the world on his shoulders and he didn't want to let his parents down. He was worried at what their reactions would be. I just can't help but imagine a scenario where he actually did come clean to his parents and just kind of dealt with the disappointment for a little bit, much like his sister had to do because I don't know, it's not like you can keep up this charade forever because he's obviously not in university anymore. He's not going to become an engineer. So I don't really know how he expected to keep up the charade. But during the time in which he was pretending to go to university, he would get up, he would leave the house, catch the bus to campus, and would just look for like a cafe or somewhere quiet that he could set up his laptop and actually play Perfect World. And then in the afternoons, he would go to the gym, work out, and then he would go home. He carried on like this for a few months until eventually, I guess he just decided to stop going to the university campus to play Perfect World, and instead he would go to the mall and find somewhere to sit down there to play Perfect World. And he would do this like most days of the week and it actually is like pretty sad like he was obviously addicted to this game it's all he wanted to do he threw away his education because of the game you know if you don't want to study a certain thing that's fine but it doesn't seem like he just didn't want to study it seemed like he just didn't want to do anything but play this game it was like an escape for him right it was somewhere where he could actually post online whatever he was feeling whatever he was thinking and he could socialize with ease he would sometimes talk to his online friends about leaving the game and when they would ask why, he would say he was gonna go to perfect world jail, that he was gonna kill his parents and go to jail, yo. I don't think anyone has ever sounded uncooler saying yo than I did just then. <laughs> gonna go to jail, yo. Anyway, I think his friends online just kind of thought this was a joke because sometimes people in these forums would just use this like dark humor, edgy. They thought they were really edgy and jokes like that were just kind of normalized. It wasn't anything serious for a lot of people. And like based on Menhaz's own typical communication, it just was kind of like, you know, oh, that's just typical Menhaz. You know, he just made some pretty horrible jokes online. Like he 
made religious jokes, he made homophobic jokes, and no one online really stood up to him. I don't know if they were just too scared to kind of stand up to these kind of jokes, or maybe they thought it was funny as well. His jokes just became increasingly darker and more offensive, and it was almost like he was going out of his way to offend as many people as possible. Like he really enjoyed getting a rise out of people. And his jokes ended up getting so offensive that one of the moderators banned him from the game for weeks, which I think, you know, he was kind of trying to be lenient on Menhas with this suspension. Like he didn't want to ban him from the game completely because he knew how much this game meant to Menhas and that he didn't really have much of a life outside of the game. And also outside of the game, pressure really started to mount on him because, you know, he knew that he couldn't keep up this fake charade of going to university forever because, you know, eventually he was going to have to either come clean or he was going to have to figure out another plan. And by mid 2019, his graduation was supposed to be looming. Like he was meant to be graduating soon. His parents were none the wiser of anything that was going on. Like in their eyes, he was still going to York University under a full scholarship and he was getting great grades and he was going to graduate like probably with honors or something. At around this time as well, there was a big celebration for Moni Ruse and Mama Taz's 25th wedding anniversary. They had over a hundred people there to celebrate with them and Menhas delivered a speech at the celebration and you know it was just like a fantastic milestone for the family. Everyone was in high spirits. Menhas's sister Melissa had actually also started studying at York University. She was studying science and I don't know if she like was aware of the lies that Menhas was telling or that she was aware that he wasn't actually going. Maybe there was just like no overlap between their classes so she didn't expect to see him around so she didn't know that he wasn't actually going to university. I mean it's just kind of crazy to think that they went to the same campus, never saw each other and she never really thought much about it. I mean sure it's a university campus, it's big, they're doing separate courses so they probably never had any classes together but still you know you think you'd be like hey I'm on campus today like what days are you on campus this week or I don't know like you would think something about it. I feel like I would if my brother was going to the same university as me I would like see him around or be like hey are you on campus this week like let's meet up or something I don't know but I again I don't really know what their relationship was like. Maybe because he was just so like reclusive she didn't really think much about it especially because like before the big like wedding anniversary with a hundred people there was a smaller little celebration a couple of days before that and Menhas actually like took his food up to his room and like didn't hang out with anybody. Like it was becoming really obvious to everybody how withdrawn he had become and one of his friends asked what's wrong with him and his grandmother was also like visibly annoyed. He eventually gave his parents a fake graduation date of July 28th and that was kind of looming closer and closer and he started changing his online name to things like subhuman and don't deserve life and he was starting to joke to his online friends about how he wanted to end his own life. But people like online, again, they didn't read too much into this because he was just like somebody who made and said shocking things online. Like he would often make offensive jokes. He would joke about wanting to end his own life. Like he had really dark offensive humor. On the 27th of July, the day before Menhas was supposed to graduate, Moni Ruse and Melissa left the house to go to work. His grandmother Faruza and his mother Mama Taz were at the house and they had both fallen asleep to have an afternoon nap. At around 3 p.m. Menhas walked up to the master bedroom with a crowbar in his hand and he struck his 50 year old mother Mama Taz in the head and slit her throat. He then went back to his laptop and sent a bone chilling message into his discord server where he spoke to his friends on Perfect World and he basically sent a photo of his mum lying dead on the floor with a knife next to her and sent a message accompanying this photo that basically just said that that was his mum in the photo. It's theorized that he used the crowbar to deal the initial blow to knock her unconscious and then he used the knife to slit her throat to 
to ensure that she was dead. After Menha sent this photo and sent this message, people were kind of in two minds. Some people were immediately concerned and others just thought it was like Menha's playing some sick joke because it wasn't exactly out of the realm of possibility for him to joke about something like this and stage a sick joke like this. But people were also thinking like maybe he wasn't joking back when he said that he was going to murder his family. The photo that he sent of his mother's dead body in the Discord server has never been released, which I would say is definitely for the best. But some interviews with some of the people who actually saw this photo in the Discord server, they said that it was really gruesome, it was really bloody, and you could see the slit across her throat. Shortly after he killed his mother and sent that message, he also went and killed his 70 year old grandmother Feruza in the same way. He first hit her with a crowbar and then slit her throat with a knife. Afterwards, he went back to his computer and posted a photo of his dead grandmother to the Discord server as well. And this is when people really started to get concerned because they're like, you know, why would he be going on with this joke for so long? He's posted two people. These photos are looking really real because they are. He also sent messages accompanying these photos. So he sent a message that was like, I killed mum and granny. I'm just waiting for my sister in five minutes and my dad in one hour. The whole situation is so so messed up. I mean, he's murdered his mother and his grandmother in cold blood. Then he's taken photos of their body, gone casually down to his computer, uploaded photos to Discord, uploaded horrible accompanying messages, played his game, had a nap while he waits for his dad and his sister so that he can murder them as well. Like, it's just like, it's nothing to him. During the time that he was waiting for his dad and his sister to get home, the members of his Discord server began investigating to see like what was going on, if this was real, if they should be calling the police. They made a separate private group chat where they could discuss everything. And one of the members was a woman named Nicole and she was a criminal justice student and she had taken the images and like reverse Google search them to see if it was like a prank photo or just something he had found on Google to try and like make this sick joke. But obviously nothing came up when she searched them. So obviously alarm bells are going off. Like these guys were already concerned, but now this is almost like the proof that they needed that this was real. Like these were not photos he had found online. There were no results and they wanted to do something. They were like trying to figure out ways that they could kind of stop him from murdering his sister and his dad as well. Like, like stop this from going any further. But the issue was if they called the police, like what are they gonna say? They don't really know anything about this guy. They don't know his surname. They don't know where he lives. Like they would basically call the police and be like, hey, there's this guy we play a game with online. His first name is Menhas. We know nothing else about him. And we think that he may have killed his mum and his grandma but we can't give you any more information. Like we don't know anything about him. So good luck finding him. One guy from the Discord server who lived in Texas contacted the police. I think a couple of people from the Discord server did call the police, but the police weren't taking them seriously because they like, they had no information about this guy. They're saying, hey, go on a wild goose chase to find this person who I think may have murdered his mom and his grandma, but that's all I know. So it was like really worrying for everyone in this Discord to like see all of this unfolding and there's like nothing they can do. And they knew that he was planning to murder his sister and his dad and they, they all they could do was like watch on in horror. One of Menhaz's closest online friends, a guy named Junior, he was contacted by some of the other people in the Discord who were watching this unfold and were really concerned. And they were asking him like, can you talk to Menhaz? Can you get in contact with him? Ask him if this is real or do you know anything about him so that we can contact the police? And even this guy Junior, one of his closest closest friends knew nothing about him, didn't know his surname, didn't know where he lived, like was Menhaz even his real name? Eventually he did manage to get in contact with Menhaz and Menhaz told him it was real and that he was going to murder his sister and his dad as well. Eventually one of the members of the Discord server was able to work out Menhaz's IP address, but this was only able to tell them what city Menhaz lived in and what internet service provider he was using, but it was something. 
It was the first real piece of Menhaz's identity that they were able to get a hold of. But by this point, it was already too late because Menhaz's sister, Melissa, walked through the front door and Menhaz killed her in the same way that he killed his mother and his grandmother. He took a crowbar, he hit her in the head, and then he used a knife to slit her throat, which left her bleeding out on the floor and she was only 21 years old. Menhaz took a photo of her dead body and he sent it privately to a Discord member named John. And John then took this photo and posted it into the group chat in Discord that they had where they were basically trying to help, you know, trying to call the police, trying to figure out what they could do to stop Menhaz. And the only reason he posted this is because they were trying to collect information that they could give to the police. In the photo of his sister, it was obvious that it had been more of a struggle than with his mother and his grandmother. And he actually told John that it had, like, she had fought back for 10 minutes and that she had been crying for most of it. Menhaz had also sent some more photos. He sent a photo of the crowbar, a photo of the knife, and then also he took a selfie with the knife. And everyone in this Discord server was, like, collecting these photos so that when the police would finally listen and take them seriously and when they can get an accurate location, like, Menhaz's actual location, they had all of this evidence against him. And then after all of this, after he had sent all of these photos and murdered three of his family members already he video called one of the discord members a guy named austin and in this video call he appeared really emotionless he showed austin all of the dead bodies of his family members lying around him he showed austin the knife and he also told him what he was going to do when his dad got home he said he was going to wait at the front door for him and as soon as his dad came through the front door he was going to beat him with the crowbar until he was unconscious before slitting his throat. Austin obviously tried to talk him out of it like many others in the Discord server already had, but it was useless. Like Menhaz was not going to listen to any of them. It was around midnight when Moni Ruse got home and entered the garage and Menhaz was waiting for him. He bludgeoned his father to death with the crowbar before slitting his throat and Moni Ruse was just 59 years old at the time. Menhaz took a photo of his father's lifeless body and once again posted it in the Discord server and by that point everyone in the Discord knew it was too late. He had murdered everybody that he said he was going to murder Murder, and all they had was a city and a first name. There was nothing that they could have done to have stopped any of this. They just had to sit there and watch all of it unfold, watch this guy murder his own entire family for what? So that he didn't have to tell them that he dropped out of uni? It's clear that his family just wanted the best for him. It doesn't seem like one of those intense tiger parenting situations. His sister was able to get out of that situation. It just was so senseless. The people in his Discord server tried to keep Menhaz active after he committed these four murders. They tried to keep him talking so that he wouldn't go out and commit more murders. They were also trying to collect more evidence so that when the police, you know, when they finally managed to get a hold of the police or like get the police involved, they had all of this evidence against him. Some of his messages read, it's been my plan for three years, literally told my parents my uni graduation was July 28th, I couldn't have delayed it any longer. I did this because I don't want my parents to feel the shame of having a son like me. I'm a pathetic coward and a subhuman. Since I'm an atheist, I believe there's no afterlife, so I was scared to die and I wanted them to die so that they didn't suffer knowing how much of a pathetic subhuman when I was. It's all very selfish. I'm just pathetic. By this point, multiple people from the Discord server had tried to contact the police throughout all of the murders happening and after the murders happening. Even one member from Tunisia tried to contact the International Crime Stoppers. Another member from Minnesota contacted his local police department who then put him on and transferred him to the Toronto Police Department because obviously Menhaz was from Markham. Now there are varying like reports of what led to the next part of this case. So some reports say that after this guy from Minnesota was transferred through to the Toronto Police Department, the Toronto Police Department then contacted Discord. Discord was able to give them Menhaz's IP address, which again was only able to give them his internet service provider. So the police then contacted his internet service provider who then promptly gave them his actual address. Another documentary claimed that a woman from the Discord server named Bianca 
was actually able to link Menhas's PayPal account to his home address and she was able to give that to police and then, you know, within 12 hours they were at Menhas's house. Either way, when police arrived to Menhas's family home, they saw someone like standing up in the window watching them who was Menhas. They didn't know that at the time because they didn't really have a whole lot to go off. They didn't know what to expect. But at this point, Menhas sent one final message to the Discord server before signing off for good. He said, the police are here, goodbye. After he sends that final message and signs out, he goes downstairs to let the police in, which is just so like, it's so weird how nonchalant he is about everything. Like he's just murdered his entire family, posted about it online. And now he's just kind of letting the police in and taking whatever comes to him. And also at this point, like for police, this is just a welfare check. Like they don't really know what to expect. They don't know the whole situation, but when they get there, they do detain Menhas while they look around the house. Menhas was completely emotionless as this happened. And apparently one of the officers said to him, who's home? And Menhas said, my family and the officer like asks if they're okay and Menhas replies and says you'll see. Inside the house they find the bodies of Feruza, Moniruz, Momotaz and Melissa and Menhas was arrested and initially charged with four counts of first degree murder. During his first initial interrogation he was pretty truthful with his answers. He admitted that it was his fault that his family was dead and he does it in just like such a nonchalant way and while he was truthful about what happened he was very like cagey about the specifics and it's honestly crazy to watch this interrogation footage because it's just insane and it's so hard to understand how someone can murder their entire family and then just visibly it looks like they don't have a care in the world like no remorse no emotion no regret nothing and some people think that the way that he acted in the interrogation and the questioning displays that he has traits of of a narcissist and I kind of have to agree because the way that he's being cagey with all of the specifics it's like he's trying to hold some kind of control over the situation. It almost seems like he's trying to play the role of a villain in a movie or a video game and it makes him question whether this is all just a big joke to him. Eventually Menhas did plead guilty to three counts of first degree murder and one count of second degree murder and the second degree murder charge was for his mother because he argues that it wasn't premeditated which I don't understand how it wasn't premeditated like this was the first of his victims. This was the first person that he murdered he said that he had been planning this for three years. I mean, either way, I don't think this would have added a lot to his sentencing because he still has three first degree murder charges and one second degree murder charge. The prosecution had a really easy case because they were handed this mountain of evidence, all of the crime scene photos, the discord messages, and a confession from Menhas himself. But he was sentenced in November of that year, so 2020. And at the age of 24, he was given life in prison with no parole for at least 40 years. Years, which means he's unable to apply for parole until he's 64 years old. He told the court, quote, I would like to just apologize to anyone I have impacted negatively with my actions, especially to the people who knew my family, friends and loved ones who I know could never have seen something like this from me happening. I am sorry. Which can I just say is like the most pathetic thing for him to have said. Like, I'm sorry for anyone I have negatively impacted with my actions. Just doesn't sound like you're apologizing for murdering your entire family. It sounds like you got a bad mark in school and you're like, yeah, I'm really sorry for like the negative effect this may have had on you. You know, it just doesn't sound like, it doesn't sound like he's apologizing for something of this magnitude. The judge said, quote, it is difficult to imagine a more horrific way to take a human life than by slitting the victim's throat. Mr. Zaman did so not just once, but four separate times over a span of hours. No right thinking member of society would see any remote correlation between the imminent disclosure of the secret of Mr. Zaman's non-attendance at school and the vicious taking of the lives of the four people closest to him. And also one thing that I wanna just talk about before the end of this video is just the fact that he did speak about this before it actually happened. And I can't imagine how it feels, the people in his Discord server who he joked about to, who he said, you know that message he sent that we spoke about earlier where he said, I'm gonna 
kill my parents and go to jail. And in 2015, so about three to four years before the murder, he actually messaged somebody else on Discord and he said, bro, I've got to tell you a secret. I'm going to murder my entire family next April. And I cannot imagine how it would feel to be these people that he actually mentioned this to and they just like thought it was a joke. And they now know that the signs for this happening and these murders happening were there all along. And you know, in no way I'm blaming these people because what could they have done? Like clearly he had a very dark, offensive and sort of edgy sense of humor. They thought that he was kidding. And even if they didn't think he was kidding, like what could they have done? They only knew his first name. They didn't know his last name. They didn't know where he was from. They didn't even know what country he was from. Like they knew nothing about this guy. But it is just interesting because I have done multiple cases that are similar where people have mentioned what they're gonna do before they do it. Like for example, Anne McGuire, the guy who murdered his teacher and he had mentioned to his friends that he was gonna kill her and everyone again just thought it was a joke. Again, I'm not saying it's their fault. I really do not think these people are responsible in any way whatsoever, but if maybe we start taking these violent jokes more seriously and not seeing them as jokes and like reporting these things to Discord or whatever kind of server it's on, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Discord, in person, it's just a really sad situation in general. Like his parents were so proud of him. They wanted to show him off. They cared about him so much and he was so easily able to murder all of them and show no remorse at at all. Four people, his grandmother, his father, his sister, and his mother all had their lives cut short because he couldn't come to terms with his own shortcomings. But that is everything. That's all from me today. That's all for this case. As always, I would really love to discuss your thoughts in the comments down below because this is just such a crazy and tragic case. I would also love to hear your thoughts on like these cases where there are messages and threats sent that are kind of passed off as a joke. I really I don't think there's anything anyone on Discord could have done, but in saying that they maybe could have reported it to Discord, I mean, it's just such a weird situation where there are these cases now arising where murders have occurred and it turns out like the killers have said something in passing that has kind of seemed like it's a joke. So I'd really love to know like what your thoughts are on that whole situation. But that is everything from me. I really hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, a wonderful rest of your week, and hopefully I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.